it is my pleasure now to introduce, introduce to you Professor uh, Rose uh, Goodchild from the uh, KU Leuven. Um, after spending some years in the United States, she came to Leuven um, to uh, lead the Dystonia research uh, there. And her research is supported by the Foundation for Dystonia Research and the VIB, the Flemish Institute of Biotechnology, which is the driving force uh, behind a flourishing uh, Flemish uh, biotechnology research and industry. Uh, Professor Goodchild has made significant progress in recent years in her dystonia research and I'm looking forward very much together with you to the novel insights she will share with us. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to give an overview not only of my own research but just kind of uh, ideas about what's coming through in the global um, research community working on dystonia. Um, and okay so what I'm going to talk about is basic research, is fundamental mechanistic research, and um, also explain a little bit how about you, you can go about doing this. So basic researchers, we, um, we break down any disease into a pathophysiological cascade where we consider that there is a, there's an insult, there has got to be a cause for a disease. This will affect some biochemical, very just a single molecule. This will then cascade up to affecting molecular networks in a cell, and in turn, dysfunctional molecular networks will affect the activity, um, the functions of an individual cell. And for neurological disease, dysfunctioning cells lead into dysfunctioning neuronal circuits, outputting, in the case of dystonia, as um, loss of control over the motor functions. Um, what you hope to do is intervene in this pathophysiological cascade. And if you think about what we have right now in terms of dystonia therapies, this mainline one that we have is botulinum toxin, which is probably what most people in the room have experienced as a dystonia therapy. This actually acts really at the end of the cascade. All the rest, the cause, the biochemistry, the cellular dysfunction is still there. It's actually, it's symptomatic. It's acting to paralyze the nerves before they, they hit the muscles. So yes, you paralyze the muscle contractions, but it's acting very, very late in this cascade. DBS, this is another, um, the other main treatment um, really available for dystonia that can be a very effective. And this is also acting quite at the end of the cascade um, against the brain circuitry. In an ideal world, and it's not easy to get there, but um, if you think about what cancer therapies are doing, they don't act all the way at the end of the cascade. They are, they are going after the molecular causes. They're acting in here. And what would be even better is if we really understood the cause of dystonia. Like, why is it occurring? We know that there's some genetic forms, but for most people, why do these symptoms develop? And we could actually come, not so much as therapies, but we could stop the cause in its tracks. So to come up with new drugs, new molecular therapies, we need to know more about these molecular cascades because to make drugs means you need therapeutic targets. So we have to define the causes and pathways that lead to dystonia. And the basic research is we're working down here. We're trying to find the biochemistry, molecular networks, and cells that are dysfunctional. So I also um, presented this quickly yesterday to get across that this isn't just uh, you know, my point of view, that if you look into what the European Commission as well as the American National Institutes of Health say about how you go about um, handling um, diseases, so the, what the European Commission will say is this, and this is in their own document about the work they supported in the past, understanding the mechanisms is essential for therapeutic target identification and verification. It is the prerequisite for rational development of new therapeutic concepts. And that's what we want for dystonia, new concepts. And then over in, across the Atlantic, physicians and scientists in academia and industry agree that basic research is essential for long-term progress against neurological diseases. So this is the type of work that my group performs. 
How do we go about doing this for dystonia? Um, we are actually quite constrained. We need causes. It's very hard as a, as a molecular cell biologist to interrogate the bottom of the cascade unless you know the cause. So for most basic research, what we do is we take the genetic forms of dystonia. So we have a cause. We know that a particular mutation in a gene causes dystonia. We also recognize that this is not what's causing most people's dystonia. Most people in this room do not have a monogenic form of a disease, but we need this tool. That's really what we do with the genetic mutations. We use them as a tool to define, to characterize toxic molecular events related to dystonia. What we also wonder and hypothesize in the end is our molecular work, our cellular molecular work down here, um, it starts from the genetic cause, and we track up to how this affects the protein, we track up to the molecular networks, and we track up to the cellular dysfunction. But in the end, what we wonder and what we hypothesize is that people who have dystonia from a different cause, cause unknown, yes, probably the, the very first parts of the pathway are, f are going to have to be different, but there'll be convergence. So maybe if we really can define these, this pathway, it will give us some other targets in here that are also useful for what we call sporadic dystonia, dystonia occurring without a family history. And there's precedent for this from things like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, where following the genetics led to much more understanding really of the sporadic disease as well. So. Um, what are basic researchers out there doing? Um, one thing that's still going on a lot, and, and this is mostly using rodent models, is trying to define which neurons in the brain, which parts of the brain are causing the dystonia. So I've, uh, I picked uh, five papers here from the literature. This is really the scientific literature. Um, um, Donna, in her talk, she talked about how she will go to the FENS meeting and talk to the scientists, the basic scientists. This is from the scientific literature, not from the clinical. And so what are people doing? Is that they are, um, there's new genetic approaches that you can use in rodents now, particularly in mice. And you don't have to have the dystonia mutation in the whole brain. You can put it in just one or two neurons, really define it to particular areas in the brain and see which parts, when they have the mutation, sufficient to drive neurological dysfunction. And so there's quite some groups working on this. Um, for the TOR1A type of genetic dystonia, it's kind of emerging that if you have dysfunction with this gene in several different brain areas, they're all sufficient to make um, neurological dysfunction. So maybe this is really something, this network disorder that um, people have been talking about. There's also a particularly interesting paper in here that is from the Dower Group in the US. And what they found is that the gene that causes um, DYT6 genetic dystonia, this seems actually most important, not for neurons, but for the cells that make the insulation in the brain. They're called myelinating cells, and the myelin surrounds the neurons. And they actually found that the DYT6 gene is really important for getting this myelination working correctly, implicating for the first time for at least um, a, um, an isolated dystonia that maybe, there's, maybe there are roles for non-neuronal cells as well in the disease. Another thing that basic researchers are still pursuing, this is again using rodent models, which is really the classic and only way into studying these types of questions, is are there particular developmental periods when the brain is susceptible to causes of dystonia? Again, we have to work with this in genetics more than anything else. But the answer does seem to be yes. Um, there are three papers here. Two on the DYT1, the Torsen A dystonia, and one again on the DYT6. In each of these cases, it seems that um, when you have the genetic mutation, um, there's a window when the brain is affected by it. And then once that window passes, the brain actually can buffer. It um, stops being so susceptible to the cause of dystonia anymore. So there's approaches using this. It's quite conceptual. We're trying to define are there developmental periods when the brain, um, when causes hurt the brain. And then if you pass these without having that cause, you, um, you may be protected. And what those protective mechanisms might look like. And then um, a third set of um, 
work that's really starting to come through is on this Tor 1A dystonia. And it's this form of dystonia that has the largest field of basic researchers working on it. Um, it's because it's the most common. It's also the first dystonia gene that was identified. And because there ha has been several groups working for many years on this. I mean, some group, this gene has been known about now, I think, for 20 years. So 20 years of basic research. Now some real new concepts that l look like they are close to therapies, it potentially starts um, coming through. So one thing um, that came out a couple of years ago, and this is from the group of Thomas Schwartz at MIT, a very good institute, as you can imagine. He's working on dystonia there. And um, what Thomas's group found is that really at the atomic level, they mapped which parts of the protein were missing, this torsin A protein, um, with dystonia mutation. And they were able to map, and I don't know how well you can see it, but here there's a little arm, there's a little pink arm, and it's missing when the dystonia mutation is in there. And because this, this little arm sticking out is missing, um, the torsin protein doesn't bind to its interactor so well anymore. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and what they are wondering now is, you know, maybe you can make a, a drug, a small molecule that would also just sit in this pocket and replace the arm. Um, if that kind of therapy was to come through, it would sit absolutely at the bottom of the cascade, which is often where things are most effective. Um, then coming across here, these are two papers, um, both in NICE journals. This is really the scientific literature about cellular mechanisms that go wrong in this disease. One of them, I think, is very interesting because after defining a bit of a cellular mechanism um, that is associated with the TOR1A dystonia, this is also a work from the US um, from Nicole Kalakos's group at Duke University. What she then went and did is she, um, she worked, she made a collaboration with Laurie Azelius, um, who's also, she's in Boston, she's also in the US, and Laurie Azelius is the person who found the TOR1A gene, she found the FAP1 gene, she continues to do so much genetic research on dystonia. Anyway, so Nicole went to, collect, um, Nicole went to Laurie and started telling Laurie about what she had found, and Laurie went into her DNA um, database and started looking if there was any evidence in the genetics of, just, of sporadic dystonia patients, whether similar mutations or effects may be in sporadic dystonia. And they actually found evidence for it, that there were certain polymorphisms that were showing up with more higher frequency in sporadic dystonia than they should for the general population. And this is important because for the first time, that idea of convergence that I, I brought up, that if you study the rare genetic forms of dystonia, in the end it can give it insight into what's happening across all dystonia. This work here really strongly supported that. And then the final thing here, on, and then I'm going to give a bit more detail about it, is work from my own group. Um, again, it's on this Torsen A. And um, we defined a novel, a, a previously unidentified role for Torsen A. This is up at the cellular level. Well, we found it was regulating lipid metabolism. And these lipids are very important in the brain, but they had not been previously implicated in dystonia. And what we actually found was that we have this particular enzyme called lipin, and that when torsin A seems to normally inhibit this, and so in the disease, torsin A is less active, and this enzyme becomes more active. Now, that work was nearly all done in fruit flies, which is often where my group does its preliminary work. And then after we've made some findings in fruit flies, we try and see if it's really relevant in the mammalian brain. Is this something that really could be a therapeutic target and relevant for dystonia? So here is actually a little bit of unpublished work, and it's done by Anna, who I think is here in the audience, a PhD student in my group. And she's already been able to show that the same enzyme that we defined was hyperactive in the fruit flies is really hyperactive in the mouse brain as well, when, it, when in mice that um, we put the torsin mutation into. So you can see this enzyme just seems more active. And then if we have two copies of the torsin A mutation, it becomes extremely hyperactive. And this is important because this, this, this protein is actually a druggable target it is theoretically possible to make drugs that would actually inhibit this. 
And this is a little bit more unpublished data from my group, just sort of giving you a feeling for how you go about doing stuff as a basic researcher. So in the work that we published, we were able to show that this, this enzyme lipin that we said was hyperactive, if we came along a genetics and inhibited it genetically, we actually made the flies start living again. Um, these flies are a strong model of dystonia. They normally don't survive. But if we knock down, if we genetically inhibit lipin, they start living. And then oh, this is in a fruit fly, and it's actually not even in the neurons of the fruit fly. So then what we start, what we move to go do, and what we're doing now, is, is this same thing actually valid and useful in a mouse? So we took the mice that have two mutant copies, and again, this, this is not compatible with survival in mice, but if we look at how well they do after they are born, if we have genetically inhibited this enzyme, again, they start doing much better. So um, just to warn you, if 10% if of basic research makes it through to the clinical stage, that's a high number. So this is just giving you a flavor of the types of things that basic researchers do. What you hope for is that you have 10 different kind of drug targets emerging from basic research like this. And then as you pursue them, you see which ones are useful and some move through to the clinic. And then I'm, this is something that I um, also mentioned yesterday and comes back to that, that previous point, is that I fear there's a little bit too little of the basic research going on in dystonia. Um, it's a small field. This is not unusual for rare diseases. Um, these are the total number of publications so far this year on three different brain diseases. Alzheimer's, which obviously is not a rare disease. Huntington's, that's a rare disease with similar prevalence to, to dystonia. And then we have dystonia. However, if you look at the papers that have this molecular mechanistic focus, it's very low for dystonia. And I just, I wish there was, um, you know, 10, 20 different stories that we could have where we start seeing, you know, possible drug targets and move these forward and see which ones succeed and which ones fail. So, um, one thing bearing in mind, I know that there are so many pa patient advocates sitting here in the audience today, is that, um, to recognize that most research funding in the EU actually does come from the member states still. It's, you know, we talked a little bit about how the EU funding will be um, uh, discussed in the, here in the European Parliament, but every one of our countries has its own research funding mechanisms. And at the moment, some countries have um, are providing support for basic research into dystonia, and I think you'll hear from Professor Klein about what some German research is stimulating in that country. But maybe, um, I don't know how accessible this is for all of you, but if you see an opportunity back in your home countries, maybe ask your own um, representatives, political representatives about, you know, do they know if there's dystonia research even um, being funded? And, um, Actually, before I completely finish, I also want to congratulate and thank Monica in particular for the work that's gone into this meeting. Because um, it's local to me, I got to see a small glimpse of what she's been doing. And Monica, it's impressive always. So. Thank you.